understand their rights and how to work better with the schools, self-advocacy. So um, we welcome you today. And Allison is going to take it from here. Oh, uh, one other thing, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat box. And we will get to those, or Allison will get to those um, as she can. And um, I will be launching a poll at the end of the, uh, the webinar. And uh, that is just a poll with information to, so that we are able to uh, continue the grants and keep everything free. So I will turn it over to you, Allison. Thanks so much, Linda. It's a pleasure to be back with you. Happy New Year, everyone. Still in January, aren't we? It's kind of going by quick. Um, Allison Scalberg here, Consolidated Planning Group. I'm happy to be here with you today. If you're joining us for the first time, we're really, really glad you're here. If you're back, uh, we're definitely glad you are back. Um, we are in webinar mode today, and what that means is that we can't see you or hear you, but we do know you're there, and as Linda said, uh, we do invite you to put your questions um, in the chat box as we're going through the presentation, and we'll aim to get to as many questions as possible. Um, so Consolidated Planning Group, uh, we are a holistic special needs financial planning firm. Our whole practice is nuanced in working with families with loved ones with dis disabilities. Uh, we are nationally certified as Social Security Advisors and members of the Special Needs Planning Academy. Uh, today's um, webinar is being recorded and all of the participants that have signed up um, for today um, will get a copy of today's slides. Uh, if you're joining us um, by podcast, uh, you can email. Uh, we'll put that um, out there, our e email address, and uh, request a copy of the slides to go along with the podcast. So today, um, the special needs planning topic that we're really talking about today is Medicaid waivers, SSI eligibility, and preserving those benefits. And for those that might be attending um, from out of state, um, the waivers that we're talking about specifically today are Texas-related uh, waivers. There are Medicaid waivers in every state in the United States that are similar. They may not have the same name, but they are under the umbrella of Medicaid waivers. So, um, it you know, it, if you're from out of state, it still may be relevant for you to learn about these waivers and the types of programs that are out there. It might be uh, available to to your loved one. Okay. So um, we're going to start by talking about some of the names of the waivers that are in Texas. Um, and again, these are Medicaid waivers. So a lot of times I wanted to start by indicating because they're Medicaid waivers, that means that to be eligible for these waivers, the individual needs to be Medicaid qualified and they need to be able um, to, to hit, be under the resource limit uh, that is required for Medicaid. And right now that is no more than $2,000 assets uh, in their name. And the, the income number is roughly $2,500, give or take a little bit um, uh, per month, okay? So the first waiver in, in, in all of our slides, that we're gonna have the name of the waiver, we're gonna have the acronyms for the waiver, and then in the upcoming slides, we're gonna be talking a little bit more about um, what each of these waivers do. So I, I wanna back up a moment because um, depending on where you are in your journey um, with your loved one, maybe it's a new diagnosis, maybe you've been long at this, right? Uh, sometimes people don't even know what the waivers are. And sometimes what we hear in the communities around here is, are you on the list? Is your child on the list? How long have they been on the list? Are they on the interest list? I mean, there's there's a kind of a lot of things uh, that, that people say, and a lot of times people don't even know uh, what they're talking about. Um, so there is an interest list, and these lists are lists that our kids, our, our loved ones should be on, and the waiting list is quite long, and we're going to um, talk about that in a few minutes and how to get on the list and those types of things. So first things first. Um, we've got the Community Living Assistant, uh, Assistance and Support Services. This is the class waiver. We have the Deaf, Blind, and Multiple Disabilities, the DBMD, Home and Community-Based Services, which is also for short HCS. We have Texas Home Living, TXHML. We have Medically Dependent Children's Program, MDCP. 
We have the Star Plus waiver, which is also the 1115 demonstration waiver. Um, typically, most states have an 1115 waiver. So if you're from out of state, that might be relevant to you. Uh, we have the Youth Empowerment Services waiver, the YES, which is also called the YES waiver. And then we also have Community First Choice, which is also, they throw around the C, um, CFC on that one, okay? So if we're getting into these waivers, like what, it, what, are, what is the point of these waivers? And really the point of the waivers is, is to waive off some of the cost of care associated with caring for a loved one with a disability. And the point behind the waivers is to provide some of um, kind of assistance, financial assistance to, to waive off some of the cost of care to keep them in home and community-based services. Because there's been many, many studies done. And what we know is that, that individuals with disabilities are much better and happier and thriving in home and community-based services, as opposed to maybe being institutionalized or something like that, which may have been kind of the thought process 30, 40, 50 years ago, okay? So we've got the Community uh, Living Assistance and Support Service Waiver, the CLASS Waiver. This is going to give home and community-based support to children and adults with related conditions. There's over 200 related conditions like um, cerebral palsy, spina bifida, that's just to name a few. Uh, the related condition must um, have occurred prior to the child um, turning age 22, okay? So then we've got deaf, blind, and multiple disabilities. And this isn't deaf or blind. This is deaf and blind with multiple disabilities, okay? I always want to make a, a clarification there because sometimes um, people think it might be one or the other. So this gives services for children and adults who are deaf, blind, or have a related condition that leads to deaf or blindness or who have another disability, okay? Home and community-based services, the HCS waiver, this gives services and supports to children and adults with an intellectual disability, um, IDD, or a related condition who live with their families in their own homes or small group homes with no more than four people. And so typically what we're looking at or what we're thinking about when and we're talking about an intellectual disability is an IQ of 70 or below or 70 and 75 and below with more than one disability. And then, of course, we have our Medically Dependent Children's Program, MDCP. This is going to give services uh, to children and adults who are 20 and younger who are medically fragile as an alternative to receiving services in a nursing facility. <clears throat> Think of equipment, G-tubes, tr trachs, ventilators. I mean, there are a lot of, um, there are a lot of reasons that a, a child may fall under the MDCP program that doesn't include a ventilator but just think of, of, of critical care, okay? All right, so then what we have is we have the STAR Plus Home and Community-Based Services, HCBS. This gives services to adults um, 21 and over to keep them in their community and not in a nursing home facility. Um, services are offered through an MCO, a managed care organization, um, and, and basically you can get on this list at age 21 and the list is not very long for this one. Texas Home Living gives services and children to adults with intellectual disability or related condition who live in their own home or their family's home. A lot of the waivers, not all of them, the class waiver is one that sticks out that doesn't really have that IQ uh, requirement of 70 and below or 75 and below with multiple disabilities. The class waiver um, is one that does not have that requirement. Um, the HCS, the Texas Home Living, a lot of these other waivers do have an I IQ of 70 and below for, for qualifications for that. Uh, the next waiver I want to talk to you about is the Youth Empowerment Services. This is a 1915C Medicaid program, and again, a lot of states have 1915C Medicaid programs. Um, and this is, um, I like this one because this gives home and community-based services to children under age 19 with serious mental, emotional, and behavioral uh, difficulties. Many counties across the state do not have a wait for this waiver. Um, it's kind of a wraparound program. Um, I always say, think of the alphabet soup, you know, we have ADHD, OCD, um, BPD, the bipolar, um, DMDD, the disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. 
this could be kids that are um, maybe they run away, maybe they um, have, have had some run-ins with the law, and it's not all or nothing, right? Maybe they've had a run-in with the law, maybe they've been experimenting with drugs, maybe they've had an issue with self-harm or some of these other things. And I just wanted to spend a, a, another minute on that because a lot of people don't know about this waiver, and because many counties don't have wait lists. And after the pandemic, we've seen a, a lot of um, crises arise in the mental health area. Um, so there is help for you in the state um, for this one. So just be aware of this. This, but they have um, they have all kinds. Of, this is truly a wraparound program. It usually lasts about a year. They have all different um, sorts of therapies that might include, and it's really tailored specifically to your child. It could be equine therapy. It could be music therapy, art therapy. There's just a whole bunch of stuff going on um, with this waiver. So it's definitely worth checking into. And it's all covered by the waiver. And so I know, um, you know, when it comes to mental health, a lot of the great mental health professionals, they charge $200 an hour and they're out of network with your insurance. And if you have a child that has some serious mental health stuff going on, um, most of the time they need a lot more than a 50 minute session every two weeks or something along those lines. So that's when this might be uh, a good a, a good sign. Um, this could also um, work in conjunction with any therapy that you're doing. If you're doing any IOP, um, intensive outpatient therapy, PHP, par partial hospitalization therapies, things like that, this could go alongside of those or could be um, kind of an after the fact um, when they're coming out of any of those programs. So uh, community first choice, this allows states to provide home and community-based attendant services and support uh, to Medicaid recipients with disabilities. It helps with activities of daily living, health-related tasks, and hands-on assistance, su supervision or cueing, and it's really designed to help them learn um, to care for themselves. And again, these services are gonna be offered through an MCO. Um, we love acronyms in the state of Texas, but the MCO, again, is the Managed Care Organization. And this is an entitlement. The list isn't very long, typically a year or less um, when we're looking at the Community First Choice Waiver. Um, okay, so we have, I think we have a couple of questions. Do you want to read those to me, Linda? Sure. Um, one of them is, I live in California, and how does this differ from Texas? Okay, so again, for people that are out of state, there are Medicaid waivers in every single state. Um, and they are different, like the 1115C uh, and then the other number one, they're, usually they're, those waivers are going to be the 1915C, you're going to have something along those lines um, in, in your state. I think that the point, if you're, uh, again, if you're attending from out of state, is that your state also has Medicaid waivers uh, across the state. California is actually a pretty good state for uh, individuals with the, with disabilities. In fact, they're, um, from from my experience of people that we've worked with that have actually moved from California to, uh, to Texas, uh, the, it is more favorable in, in California and the lists are, are, are shorter and, and the services are, are greater um, in California. So, and, and I'll be happy to one off with you if you wanna reach out to us um, on for, for California. Um, then I see, um, does the youth empowerment waiver include autism? And so that is a great point um, that you brought up, and thank you for um, for putting that out there. The youth empowerment services is predominantly for mental health. So if we have a kid that is basically high functioning on the autism spectrum or ADHD, then they may qualify for the YES waiver. But if the underlying diagnosis is like a significant diagnosis um, of other things like Down syndrome or, or CP or muscular dystrophy or things like that, they're not likely going to qualify for the YES waiver. The, the predominant issues need to be mental health first, um, as opposed to being kind of the secondary diagnosis. Um, okay, for the youth empower, yes. Yeah, I just wanted to know, we're getting quite a few questions. Do you want to hold those until the end? No, I think I'm okay. okay. We'll, we'll go through a couple of these questions because um, I actually really like questions because if you have a question, somebody else has it too. And I think it's good uh, to, uh, to talk about. So for the youth empowerment waiver, does my child need to have a disability or is it 
for all children below the age of 19. Um, so again, with the youth empowerment, um, there needs to be something documented mental health wise, like do they have ADHD, do they have anxiety, depression, OCD, oppositional defiance, um, disruptive mood dysregulation disorder, that's one that they throw around now, bipolar, borderline personality, those are all kinds of things. But I've seen kids that had um, ADHD and associated anxiety and depression along with that. So there, there does need to be some testing. If there's no testing done, then they will, um, they will do testing. Um, but they're, they're going to want to have documentation of the underlying issue. Um, is the Texas Home Living IQ based? Yes, that is going to be the 70 and below. For CFC, do you need to be getting Medicaid to qualify? So. With these waivers, um, Medicaid comes alongside of these waivers, so you don't have to be getting Medicaid right this second, okay? Um, if you qualify for the waiver, then they're going to do the, the Medicaid qualifications. And what a lot of families think is that I don't qualify for Medicaid. My kid is under age 18, so it's based off of my assets, not the kid's. And when it comes to these waivers and the Medicaid qualifications, it is going to be based off of the kids' assets, not yours. So you can throw the idea of I make too much money to, for my kid that's under age 18 to qualify uh, for, for Medicaid. You can throw that out the window. Um, what about the START waiver? Um, I'm not familiar with the START waiver, so um, we'll check into that further. I'm not familiar with that. Um, if anybody, if we have any professionals or anybody out there that is familiar, if you guys want to put that in the chat box, I think that's a great place to put it. With the regards to the CFC waiver, the Community First Choice waiver, and the Star Plus waiver, are these different waiver programs? And um, if so, can um, one can you qualify for both at the same time? It's one waiver at the time, and they are different waivers. Okay, so it is one waiver at the time. Is there an income requirement for the yes? Do parents have to be lower, lower income? I think we addressed that. It's going to be based off of the child's income, not yours. Um, and can you please tell me exactly is what is meant by a waiver? So I'm going to re I'm going to just repeat that because I think that's so important. So many times we just in our community we just throw this around. This waiver is your kid getting a waiver? Are they on the waiver list? And the waiver is designed. They're all Medicaid. They're all Medicaid waivers. And the waivers are designed to waive off some of the cost of care of caring for an individual with a disability. It could provide attendant services, it might, um, which would be caregiver services, it might provide respite hours, it might provide, uh, depending on which waiver it is, it might, um, it might provide therapies such as PT, OT, speech. If you can think of the therapy, a lot of these waivers cover them. Some of the waivers don't cover as, as many therapies. Class, for instance, doesn't cover as many of these therapies. Then we have um, someone in the chat box that says, my son's income and assets are below the limits. However, when reporting expenses, we have received a letter indicating that he will not be eligible after the pandemic coverage is removed. Is this correct and how can we learn? Okay, so this is an ongoing issue. Um, thousands upon thousands of letters have gone out across the state. I don't know about other states, but across the state of, uh, to Texans saying that the, the health crisis is ending and that basically you're going to lose Medicaid effective April 1st. You may or may not lose Medicaid. Um, the Health and Human Services website, you can go out to the Health and uh, Human Service website and you can... Um, you can apply, you can reapply, and you can also go to your local Medicaid office to find out about this. Um, so how can we learn why he's no longer eligible? The Health and Human Services phone number is a good place to start by calling. And my advice to you, if you don't have a lot of extra hours in your day, call when they first open. I can't remember if they open it. I think they open at 8 a.m., either 8 or 9 a.m. Call when they first open, and you'll only be on hold for like five minutes. But if you try to call at 12, 1, 2, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, you're going to sit on hold for an hour, hour and a half. So just trust me in knowing um, call first thing in the morning. But there are local Medicaid offices as well. And we are on, in the process of getting the, – the truth is, is these letters have been going out um, in the masses, and it's really causing a lot of concern for people, especially for kids that are already getting a waiver and they've been on a waiting list for, for – um, 
many, many years, they're afraid that they're going to lose the waiver because you do have to stay Medicaid qualified to get the waiver. But these letters have been going out unilaterally, basically letting every know, everybody know that if you were getting Medicaid because of the health crisis and the extension, um, that, that that extension is, 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 is ending, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to lose it. And there is going to be more to come on that. Um, not in uh, not in today's presentation, but we actually had a, a meeting about that yesterday because there's a lot of confusion, including at CMS on this. So, um, okay. Also, if you had a Medicaid case already, can you check your status by going into your account at your? Um, yes, you can. It, it, that was a statement. You absolutely can check your status. And sometimes, you know, they'll have like if they're awaiting documents from you, if there's some kind of um, information that needs to be provided or something along those um, lines. And, and you can also uh, make an account, create an account if you don't already have one. So all good information in the chat box. Thanks guys for um, sharing that and asking those questions. So again, um, the waivers are designed to waive off some of the costs of care. When we have a loved one with a disability, their care needs are great. It's expensive on um, what we're spending. Um, on 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 their care needs, whatever they may be. So some of the services that are available in all waivers, adaptive aids, financial management services, supported employment, employment assistance. Some have minor home modifications, respite services, um, services in all, but MDCP um, that kind of includes everything already, is kind of all-inclusive in the MDCP. There's professional therapies, which I mentioned, OT, PT, um, speech therapy, music, massage, rec, equine, art. Um, there's all kinds of therapies out there. Uh, unlimited prescriptions, dental, and nursing. So these are some of the services. Um, today, um, you, you guys, when we send uh, the slides out today, we'll also send you the Texas waiver budget. It's, it's a long spreadsheet and it looks really outdated, but it's actually the last time that they updated the budgets. And it's gonna show the budgets for each of these waivers. Some of these budgets are as big as $340,000 a year. So it's not small potatoes when we're thinking about the waivers, because a lot of families come to us and they say, what do I care about Medicaid? We have health insurance, we have good income. Why do I even care about these waivers? Do I want this waiver? Do I care about Medicaid? Do I care about Medicaid eligibility and those types of things? And I would say that the answer is yes, unless you, you, know, you guys have a special needs trust that is going to be funded with millions and millions of dollars. I would say that every little bit helps when it comes to these waivers. And if a waiver is, you know, you know, offsetting expenses for your loved one at a hundred grand a year, even if it's 50 grand a year, it's a lot more than what you're getting right now if you're not getting a waiver. So, so maintaining your eligibility for that, I think is an important thing. Um, some of the other waivers um, um, provide transportation services, residential services, equine therapy, uh, day have, they're changing the rules on the day have, and they're not calling it day have anymore um, and, and nursing. So there has been some, some definitive uh, rule changes on that as well. So you're going to want to check that if you've got a loved one that is in kind of a, a day have. A lot of them are getting creative and changing the names and not really calling it day have and changing kind of the structure of their program so it will be in line with the law change. Um, so waiver general um, eligibility. So um, most waivers are for all ages. MDCP and STAR Plus are the exceptions. The financial eligibility for all waivers um, for 2022, uh, is the number is 300% of SSI. And Michelle, if you'll put that in um, to the chat box, 300% of um, SSI, the number for 2023 is going to be 2742, okay? That's the, the, the total income allowable for the kid. Um, earned or unearned income, all sources, 2742 for 2023. Okay, so that's the financial eligibility. Um, individuals must meet the functional eligibility criteria for the specific waiver. And the big thing that you need to know is the eligibility is not determined until an individual comes up on the top of the waiting list. Okay, so when we put our loved one on the waiting list, 
we're not having to prove their eligibility to get on the waiting list now. I mean, if they're not 21, we don't need them to be on the star plus waiting list. Okay. And if they're over 20, we don't need them to be on the MDCP uh, waiting list, but ultimately the, the, the qualifications are going to come when they come up to the top of the list. And unfortunately, um, as many of you know, the waiting uh, list in Texas is quite long, and some would say that it's as long as 17 years um, before you're going to come up on one of these waivers, um, these lists for services. So it's the first come, first serve. Um, it is a statewide list. And the wait can be as long as 17 years. And again, the whole point of these waivers is to, vert, um, to divert individuals from institutional um, settings, from you know a residential setting, and and keep them in the home and community-based services. And for people that are already in uh, an institutional setting, it helps them transition back from an institutional setting into home and community-based services. Um, okay, so why the change from saying day have? We have um, a question. We had, I, I'm, I'm going to have to go back and look on that. Um, um, we had a, a complete webinar on this um, with Mark, Michelle. If you want to grab that webinar um, and kind of put the link for it or, or find that one in the chat box. Um, we, Mark Olson did a complete webinar on the changes um, with the waiver programs and the day have and the kind of the law change. And so um, I would invite you to go to our YouTube channel. All of our um, webinars, our past webinars live on the YouTube channel. And this was actually just a few, uh, a few weeks ago and it ab absolutely was recorded. So I would invite you to check that one out. And um, if Michelle can find that, she'll put that in the chat box for us. Um, and, and if not, then you can email us afterwards and we'll make sure that you get a copy of that webinar um, to look at that a little bit further. So when we're talking about the wait list and how to get on the list, this is where I see a lot of confusion um, with families. Um, a lot of families will say, oh, yeah, my child is on all the lists. And when, in fact, your child is on the HCS, Texas Home Living and Community First Choice list, okay? So there are different numbers and different links to get on different lists. So some, some of you may be familiar with something called your um, uh, LIDA or LIDA, however you pronounce it, Local Intellectual Development Disability Authority, okay? So your local authority is where you are going to get on the HCS. Texas Home Living and Community First Choice. And let me give you a little news flash. In Texas, you would think that we would have like a website and you could create a username and password and you just log in and you put your kid on the list and you can log in and check the status of where your child is on the list. That does not exist. You do have to call your local intellectual disability authority to get on the list. You do have to follow up with them to find out where your child is on the list. I hope that changes, but that is the lay of the land right now. So um, this link below here is to find out who your local authority is. For instance, Houston is the Harris Center. A lot of them um, for years in the state of Texas were called MHMR. A lot of them have changed their names. Uh, I know Fort Bend County is going to be Texana, but this link right here, all you're going to have to do is put that link in your browser. You're going to put your zip code in, and then it's going to tell you exactly who your local authority is, the phone number to reach out to them directly to get your child on the list or to check the status of where they are on the list. So I don't want to miss up top here where we have MDCP class and the deaf blind multiple disabilities. There's a separate phone number. It has nothing to do with your local authority. There's a separate number you call to get your child on this these interest lists, okay? And there is yet a separate phone number for the STAR Plus waiver. So this is going to be a really important slide if you're trying to figure out the first time how to get your loved one on all of the lists. This is going to be uh, the, the, the slide that you're going to want to pay uh, special attention to. Um, I have something in the, the Q&A, and it says, we've been on the HCS waiting list for 12 years. If he gets the waiver, do I have to get training to take care of my um, son at home? And it just, it really depends on the waiver that you get. And it also depends on the age of your child, if they're over 18 or if they're under 18, on whether or not you can be paid as a caregiver. There, as I mentioned before, some of these waivers have um, attendant services or respite services. 
So it is possible in some of these waivers that the parent can actually be paid as a caregiver as opposed to having outside care, caregivers, which has been helpful to a lot of families, um, also namely because it has been really a challenge um, since COVID. I mean, I think it was a challenge before COVID, but after COVID, it just became almost impossible to find and keep good caregivers. And that has been an ongoing um, issue. It's an ongoing issue in Texas, but it's actually an ongoing issue all throughout the U.S. It's not, we are, we are not alone here. So that, like I said, it's going to depend depend largely on what waiver uh, you have uh, qualified for. And it is also going to depend on the age of your child because you can't be paid as a caregiver when the child is under age 18 on these um, waivers, okay? So um, we're gonna talk about a crisis diversion slot. So we've talked about the discouraging news that the waiting list is 17 plus years. Um, there is a such thing as a crisis diversion slot. This is the HCS crisis diversion slot. So this is for the HCS waiver. And the requirement is 70 and below is, um, from an IQ perspective or 75 and below um, with multiple disabilities for the HCS waiver. So what the crisis diversion slot does is it basically moves you up from the 17 year waiting list to right now. Okay, this is I'm going to get this waiver right now. And so think about crisis. And when I tell people, I, I, I truly hope you don't have a crisis. But if you do, don't miss the crisis opportunity, okay, to get on the waiver. So what are some examples of crisis? Um, we have seen um, kids, uh, adult, adult kids that have become a threat to themselves or others. Uh, they, um, a, a loved one that is at risk of being placed outside of the home because the, the family can no longer care for the individual, provide services. Another example of a crisis is a death or a critical illness of one of the caregivers. So mom or dad dies, um, mom be, becomes ill. I mean, think cancer, heart attack, stroke, some kind of major illness that's going to take away from her caregiving abilities. That could be a crisis, mom or dad. Um, we could have parents. We could have aging parents. So I could be a caregiver and I could have an aging parent that now I need to take care of because my aging parent has fallen ill and I need to take care of them. And as a result, I have no ability to provide the caregiving services without some help to my loved one. That could be an example of crisis. But again, think um, threat to themselves or others um, at risk of being placed outside of the home. Those are all reasons for crisis. So don't miss the crisis. So what happens if you do have a crisis? The first place you call is your local intellectual disability authority. They're gonna help you with the process. They're gonna make sure you're involved with the process and that's exactly what should happen. Um, what we have found is since COVID, a lot of these local authorities have been understaffed. They've had a lot of high turnover of staff and so sometimes the response we would hope uh, or we that we would expect for a crisis diversion has not been great. All of these local um, authorities have a 24-hour crisis line, so you should know that. They all have that, and that link um, to find your local authority is going to have their crisis line as well as their, like, their, just their daily phone number. Um, but there are agencies that we can get involved. If you're not getting anywhere with your local authority, it's not unheard of. We've definitely heard from families that we're not making progress with their local authority. Um, but there are definitely other agencies and other um, places that we can get involved that are um, designed to help move that along. And we've definitely had success of some of our families um, getting uh, getting those crisis, crisis waivers. I, I can think of one. Um, I can think of one where the, the grandmother was the caregiver for the grandson. Grandma passed away and left grandpa to care for the grandson. However, grandpa still worked full time and he absolutely needed to work full time. The kid was a threat to himself and others. Um, and he was truly at risk of being placed outside of the home because the end of the line was grandpa, right? Uh, there was nobody else to take care of him, and we were able to get a crisis diversion slot um, for him. And I can think of another one where it was uh, a young man on the autism spectrum, um, a single dad, he moved his mother from out of state to help provide caregiving services to 
um, you know, the grandson and the grandson, as he was getting older, he was becoming more and more aggressive and was, you know, really trying to hurt grandma and, um, and grandma could not handle him. He was, he was too big and he was too strong and he was too angry. And so we were able to get a crisis diversion uh, slot in that example. So that is, that is another one. Again, dad had to work. Grandma didn't work. Dad's a single dad. Somebody had to pay the bills. And that's kind of basically how that one went, um, went down. Okay, so uh, the PASRR diversion and transition from nursing facilities and or specialized services. And so this is for uh, people that are already um, already in uh, kind of an institutional setting. Um, so we, I have someone that says, so my wife died. So is that a crisis being I've been taking care of him myself and we are on the HCS waiting list? I absolutely 100% if you have a death of a caregiver, if someone who's died, don't miss the opportunity for a crisis slot. Um, push the envelope. You need to explain why it is a crisis, what the impact has been on the family, and why the individual is at risk of being placed outside of the home. You know, some people are aging. So we have, you know, a parent that passes away and the other parent isn't that healthy themselves. Um, the other parent may still work. Um, there may be a, any number of challenges going on, but th this is a real thing. Um, crises do exist, and, and most people don't even know that there is a such thing as a crisis diversion slot. So I just like to spend a little um, bit of time chatting on that. So as we mentioned earlier, Consolidated Planning Group is a holistic special needs financial planning firm. We are domiciled in Texas, but we work with people all across the United States, not just in Texas. So one of the things that we talk about, and again, we have our YouTube channel that has all of our webinars and they're all surrounding special needs topics. And the thing is, is when we start talking about these topics, um, and our loved ones with disabilities, uh, the, it, the depth is deep and wide on the topics and the things that matter and the things that are super, super important. So there are specific webinars um, dedicated to, you know, basically all of the topics out there um, surrounding kind of your planning journey, whether you know, you're thinking about special needs trust, guardianship, SSI, and Medicaid. It's just all across the board that will be out on our YouTube channel. And I think we um, put that in the chat box. It's the Consolidated Planning Group YouTube channel. You can subscribe to that for free. There's no cost uh, associated with that. And you can kind of look through the titles that might be most appropriate for you. I think there's over 250 uh, 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 topics, different webinars out there. So as you're getting started and thinking about working um, and moving forward with special needs planning, um, one of the things that we want to mention to you, I think that it is important that you understand what does a special needs planner do? Um, you know, how can they help you formulate a plan? Um, and we're kind of of the theory at Consolidated Planning Group of, you know, we're hopeful and optimistic, but we want to plan for the worst and hope for the best. And when the best happens, everything's good, right? Um, but we think it's very, very important to understand the difference between a special needs planner and a special needs attorney. Um, a special needs planner, there, there, there's over 250,000 financial advisors out there, okay, um, in the U.S. That's a lot. Um, less than about 150, not 1,000, 150 total are nuanced in special needs. When it comes to an individual with a disability, a loved one with a disability, our situation is specialized, and you do want to work with a specialist when it comes to um, planning for the financial future, future care cost estimates for your loved one, um, and also in working with uh, an attorney and creating your documents, okay? So, um, so just like I always use kind of the, the analogy of if you had a heart attack, you're not going to go to the PCP and get care for your heart. You're not going to go to the um, podiatrist. You're going to go to a specialist. You're going to go see the cardiologist. I, I feel like it's the same thing when, when we're um, planning for a loved one with a disability. Same thing when it comes to a special needs attorney. There's a lot of confusion on what we do and what a special needs attorney does. Um, we get calls all the time for people saying, hey, look, we need to set up guardianship. I need you to help me set up a third party special needs trust and things like that. That is not what we do. Um, I kind of um, simplify things by saying that they're the paper and we're the money, okay? They're the paper, the legal documents, you got to have them. 
Um, but you can have the best special needs trust in the whole wide world. And if we don't know how we're going to fund the future care for your loved one, how we're going to get the money into the right buckets into the special needs trust, then it's not even necessarily worth the paper that it's written on, right? Okay. So we do want you to work with a special needs attorney. We do have referrals. We make referrals um, all across the state of attorneys that we know are specifically nuanced and working um, with uh, families uh, with special needs. Um, I would say don't, um, you know, we actually work with a lot of attorneys that, that seek out other attorneys um, to handle their special needs stuff because maybe they're a real estate attorney or maybe they're a tax law attorney, but they're not a special, they're not nuanced at all in special needs. So don't use your brother that's going to do you a favor and not charge you anything that has no background in you know, special needs, don't, you know, use your neighbor that's going to give you a discount that has no background in special needs. Because what we find is when people cut corners, if people try to do it themselves, um, the DIY documents that they're downloading from, uh, you know, the good old internet, uh, a lot of times they're wrong. So you might save money or it might have been free, but if your documents are wrong, and if, you're, if your trust don't, you know, qualify in the eyes of the Social Security Administration as a, as a bona fide special needs trust, then you can have some real issues. So I always just want to mention that. So to get started, we want you to gather all your planning uh, documents. These are going to be all of your statements. Um, what insurance do you have with your employer, outside of employer, health insurance, life insurance, disability insurance? This is going to be your stocks, bonds, mutual funds, 401ks, 403bs, pension plans. Um, this is going to be any wills or trusts that you already have set up. This is going to be your social security statements, any annuities that you have. Those are kind of the planning documents. Because when we have a loved one with a disability that's going to have care needs for the rest of their life, not just the rest of ours, it's like a third bucket for retirement. So if you're if you're married, you've got you know two retirements. You're going to spend 25 to 35 years. Well, what if we need to plan for our money to last 25 to 35 years? after we're gone. So it really takes some careful planning and it's really important that we have money in the right buckets so we can maintain the eligibility for state and federally funded programs such as Medicaid, Medicaid waivers, SSI, other benefits such as that. It's really important that we have our, our money in the right buckets for that. Um, we talk about developing a letter of intent. We do have a, a, a topic on that, uh, the, the letter of intent. And I, I often refer to this as a family love letter. As a caregiver, we know more. We have forgotten more than anybody will ever know about the care needs of our loved one. Um, a letter of intent really puts it in writing that if you're incapacitated or you're no longer here on earth, what are your intentions for your loved one with a disability? Some families have kids that are nonverbal, okay? Uh, this really matters. And, and a lot of times in families, um, if we're in a husband and wife situation or, you know, two caregivers, one works and one is the caregiver. And so sometimes even in our own ha household, the other um, spouse may not know all of the care, you know, steps that the other caregiver is doing. So this is really going to put your heart, um, your interest, and all the details of your child, their diagnosis, their meds, their doctors, their schooling, religious preferences, you name it, it is on this letter of intent. We do have a template for that as well. But most importantly, when we start um, thinking about special needs planning, um, we want you to think about the vision, um, your vision of how you hope things will look for your special needs child, but most importantly, how you hope things will look for you for your own retirement because most of uh, the parents that we work with we don't ever have to be told <laughs> to uh, look out for the best interest of our kids because we all do that to a fault and we put ourselves on the back burner and if we have a loved one that is going to have care needs for the rest of their life not just the rest of ours um, you know it's kind of the marathon not the sprint our retirement is going to look a little bit different than uh, than the retirement of somebody whose kids get up and out and go to college and get out, you know, get out of the house. It's a, it's a totally different thing. But if you want to extend your ability to provide caregiving services for your loved one, you got to have some balance in your retirement of caregiving and a little bit of the vision of what you hoped your retirement would look like. Because if you don't, what happens is your own health fails and your ability to provide the caregiving services that you wanted to provide, um, it, it, it is diminished and it, it is um, really, it, it ends up being where um, you're going to have to pull in additional help uh, in the future, okay, sooner than you had planned. So, 
how how are we going to fund future care? So I mentioned pre- preserving the eligibility for state and federally funded programs. Um, we're talking about SSI, Supplemental Security Income and Social Security, also known as SSDI, or sometimes Retirement Survivors Disability Income reti- um, under a parent's record. Guys, we have entire um, presentations on uh, SSI and Medicaid and Social Security and Disabled Adult Child that's now called Childhood Disability Benefits. It is complicated, but it is very, very important that you understand the differences between SSI, which is Supplemental Security Income, and Social Security. They're two very, very different programs, okay? A lot of our kids um, have not Qualified. If you have kids that are under age 18, a lot of our kids maybe haven't qualified um, for SSI because when we're talking about SSI, we've been talking about Medicaid waivers, and the Medicaid eligibility for these waivers is based off of the child, not the parent. But when it comes to SSI, okay, it is if your child is under age 18, it is based off of the parent's income and assets, not the child. Um, but that all changes when our child uh, turns 18, um, and it's going to be based off of their income and assets for SSI eligibility. SSI for 2023 is 914 per month, um, so just know that it's 914 per month. It has went up uh, last year in 2022. It was 841 per month. So. Another thing that you want to be aware of is establishing a special needs trust for their future care. There are two places that you can have money um, above and beyond the $2,000 means-based test for SSI purposes and Medicaid, and that is a special needs trust, and that is an ABLE account. So those are the two places that you can have money above and beyond uh, the requirements for Medicaid, a special needs trust and an ABLE account. A special needs trust, you can have an unlimited number of um, assets. It could literally be millions of dollars that won't count against them. In an ABLE account, um, Michelle, if you'll put this in the chat box, the ABLE account contributions just changed for 2023. It is 17,000 per year. It's always the, the, the gift tax exclusion, whatever that is. Um, it's 17,000 per year for 2023. And if the individual is working, they can put an additional 13,590 um, into an ABLE account for 2023. The disability did have to begin prior to 26 to have an ABLE account, but they did just pass a law uh, that they're moving that eligibility that if the disability began prior to 46, that they can have an ABLE account, but that does not take effect until 2026. And the other way that we provide um, you know, funding for our, our loved ones and their care is life insurance and other assets. So typically, most people, unless they're just naturally affluent or grandparent or somebody um, has died and has left lots and lots of money, and that, that funds the trust. But typically, people don't really fund their trust more than a few dollars during their lifetime. A lot of times, what they do is they keep their retirement assets kind of nimble for them for their own retirement. If you're going to spend 25 to 35 years in retirement, you want to make sure that you know you have enough assets um, you know, to live off of uh, during your retirement. So oftentimes what happens is people use life insurance to fund the special needs trust. It would be on the life of the parents. Um, it could be on the life of um, any a family member, but most oftentimes we see the life of the parents. And upon the death of the parent, the life insurance proceeds funds the special needs trust. So the beneficiary would be the special needs trust for little Johnny, um, the special needs trust for the benefit of John Smith or whatever the name is, right? Um, we would not ever want to leave life insurance proceeds or any assets you have directly to your loved one with a disability. And that is very, very important. Okay. I think that um, um, are your specialized attorneys within the ARG network? They are, um, they are, they are in network. I, I, it's not the right word as far as the um, in network, but the, the, the National Association of Elder Law um, Attorneys, um, which is where you want them to be. And so I think we would have to, we have a number of attorneys that we refer to all across the state. They are, um, they are quite honestly very involved with the UT Special Needs Planning Conference annually, the legal conference. They're, they're speaking, you know, at these things. So they, they're definitely... Um, each one of them, you'd have to check um, specifically to see which one that they are networked with. Um, 
Okay, could you please touch on the PASRR? My son is in a private assisted living community. Would that qualify? We would have to take that one offline and look that up a little bit further. And um, we've not had that many that were moving from residential in to back to the home and community based services. But you can um, connect with us offline, and we will um, will help you with that. Um, let's see. So we had another person that mentioned that um, when their spouse passed away, they had to quit working to take care of the loved one with a disability and he gets an SSI check. So we live on the check. So would that be a crisis? That's absolutely, absolutely a crisis. So um, I think that you are in a good um, place. Well, an, an unfortunate place, I would have to say, but I think you're in a very good place. Uh, to pursue the crisis diversion. Um, what do you mean by the gift tax? So whatever like you can give, so last year for 2022, you can gift, um, it was it was 16,000 per person. So if you had a, a spouse, each spouse could gift up to $16,000. So this year it's 17,000. Um, and so that's what the ABLE contributions are. Um, can an ABLE account work like any checking account? Can the account holder withdraw money for the use? Do they issue a credit card in the ABLE account? Some of them issue debit cards. I'm not really a fan of the ones that issue the debit cards. I like the ones that just connect the, the ABLE account to your own debit card. So when you want a distribution, it goes straight into your account, your checking account, and then you um, you pay for things with your own debit cards. I don't I don't think multiple um, debit cards are really unnecessary, um, but it, so it's not really a checking account. Um, it you know it's typically usually an investment account, and you can invest it as um, as low risk or high risk as you want to. Most people take pretty low risk um, in their able account. Um, but one thing you want to know about an ABLE account is as a special needs trust can have an unlimited amount of money in it, um, an ABLE account will cause you to disqualify for Medicaid if there's ever more than $100,000, um, if there's ever more than $100,000 in the ABLE account. So no more than $100,000. So we know that our um, kids have um, care needs that are um, far greater than $100,000, usually a future care cost estimate. We do these very specifically for individuals and families um, on what, you know, their specific care needs for their child. But quite oftentimes, these future care cost estimates are at a minimum of like two and a half million on up. It just depends on what the, the, the needs are. Um, but we do those. We tailor um, we very specifically do future care cost estimates that are very specifically tailored to you, your family, your loved one, their care needs, their level of care. When you think they um, that you want to start care, we have some families that say, you know, my child is going to have care needs the rest of his life. I want to provide those care services um, for as long as I can, say 70, 75, and then, you know, look at you know, alternative living arrangements and other people say, no, you know, I want my loved one to have some autonomy. I want them to have community. I want them to have friends. I want them to have purpose. And, you know, my child is going to stay in the public school to age 22. And then we're going to do a transition program. But somewhere, you know, between 25 and 30, I definitely want them to move, um, whether it's a group home or, you know, you know, some of these facilities. We have residential, we have had residential panels um, they have been Texas-based, um, so we're um, I'm on our YouTube channel. There's a whole bunch of stuff regarding residential, so if that's on your radar, you can check those out. But basically, we do kind of like a speed dating type thing um, where we have a lot of different um, places. Uh, you know, it might be Daymark Living or um, uh, Brookwood. I mean, we just uh, – Marbridge. There's been so many of them, right? And um, they come on and it's like a speed dating thing. They tell us who, what, where, when, why, how much, where are we, who do we serve, how much do we cost, do we take waivers? Um, so we have several of those on our YouTube channel. So you guys uh, can definitely check that out. Um, okay, any family-based income limits um, to apply for SSI or Medicaid for children with special needs? Um, so yes, um, and I, I do wanna repeat that because it is an important question. Um, SSI is based off of the family's income and assets if the child is under age 18. So oftentimes your kid does not, even though your child is clearly disabled, they don't qualify for SSI because it's a means-based program. It has, it's for the disabled and the indigent. So if the child is under age 18, it is based off of the parent's 
uh, income and assets. Once the child turns 18, it's based off of the child's um, income and assets, not the parent. And this includes if um, even if you have guardianship of the child and they still live in your house and all that kind of stuff, it still includes that. Um, then we have another question that says, can ABLE accounts be subject to a guardianship? This would include income that is currently subject to guardianship. I'm not sure that I understand the question, but what I do know for sure is that whether you have a guardianship or not in place, that there definitely can be an ABLE account um, specifically for that individual with a disability. So we can set those ABLE accounts up. You might have power of attorney, healthcare power of attorney, you might have guardianship. And, and if you're speaking of guardianship of the estate as opposed to guardianship of the person, in the state of Texas, you do not need guardianship of the estate to set up an ABLE account. So I hope that I addressed um, your question that you were asking there. I'm not sure that I did. If you, if I didn't, put it back in there. Um, okay. So then, um, so what we have on our screen, we, we really, you know, kind of end all of our presentations. These are just things that should be on your um, special needs planning radar. Um, how to develop a comprehensive special needs care plan. Um, you know, we want you guys to plan early, um, plan before the crisis, have a plan and work your plan, right? Um, we, we want, when we plan early, we're more likely to reach our goals. We're more likely to hit the targets that we wanted to hit for our loved one and their future care needs. We don't want to wait until something happens, until there's a heart attack, a stroke, a death, an accident, something along those lines. So plan early. Um, again, we can help with the future care cost estimates. A lot of people come to us every week and they say, I want to plan for the worst. I want to hope for the best. But I, I don't even know I have a special needs trust, but I don't even know how much we need to fund that. Can you help us with that? And that's where we're going to tailor those um, specifically to you. We've talked today about the Texas waivers interest list. These are Medicaid waivers. There are Medicaid waivers in every state throughout the United States. And you can simply Google Medicaid waivers in the states that you're in, put your state first and then say Medicaid waivers. And there, there's going to be a list um, pop up and you're, you're going to learn how to get on those waiver interest lists um, as well. Um, we talking about SSI, SSDI, understanding the difference and knowing when to apply, how to apply all those types of things. We hit a little bit on the ABLE accounts. We've got an entire uh, presentations, podcasts, and webinars on the ABLE accounts. Beneficiary designations, this is a really, really important um, topic, and I just want to mention, I know we're out of time today, um, but the beneficiary designations, when we have a loved one with a disability, we don't ever, ever, ever want to name them directly as a beneficiary. So if your kid's name is John Smith, we never name John Smith as a beneficiary. Um, if you've done it, I would say probably 95% of the people on here either have their disabled loved one named as a beneficiary or named specifically as a contingent beneficiary. If you've done this, don't panic. It's okay. You can fix it. You can fix it for free. All you got to do is call the carrier. So life insurance, any investment accounts, anything like that, all you got to do is call them, get a change of beneficiary form and, and, and get them remove their name um, from that. And how you want to change it is if you have the special needs trust, if you don't have the special needs trust, you want to set one up. And then you want the beneficiary to say for the special needs trust for the benefit of John Smith. Then uh, upon your death or upon, you know, the assets will go to the special needs trust for the benefit of John and not directly to John, because if it goes directly to John, then he's going to have more than $2,000 in his name. Then he's going to lose his Medicaid eligibility. He's going to lose his waiver. He's going to lose SSI. And it's a domino effect of negative events. So anyway, you can totally fix it. Um, we talked about a little bit about the special needs trust. Um, one big thing that I need to mention um, is child support. If you are in a position where you're in a divorce situation and child support is going to continue past age 18, this is going to need to be redirected by a first party uh, to a first party special needs trust to avoid it being accounted against them uh, as income for SSI purposes. You'll have to work it with an attorney on this. You'll have to get a court order on this. Um, we always say start um, touring residential living facilities, um, transition, um, transition programs, things like this. Waiting lists can be long, so tour early. Um, what we want to avoid is your loved one coming home from high school uh, and having nowhere to go and nothing to do. And so whether they're 18 or they're 22 or whatever age it is, what's next? Always be thinking of next. If we're 15, 
What's next? Where do we, you know, what do we need to be thinking about? Um, we also want you to consider guardianship, alternatives to guardianship, power of attorney, healthcare power of attorney. And in Texas, we do have a supported decision-making agreement. Some states have them, some states don't. So if you're joining from out of state, you want to check on that. Um, but there, um, there are definitely alternatives. Guardianship is going to take away all their rights, their right to vote, their right to drive, their right to marry, all of those things. There is, um, there is partial guardianship um, that will retain some of their rights, and there are uh, less restrictive options. So the law in Texas is the least restrictive, most appropriate is, is what the law is. And a qualified attorney, you don't have to know everything about this. A qualified attorney is going to walk you through these options, learn about your child, and, and help come up with the, the best decision, because I know a lot of people feel nervous about this. But you can start that process six months prior to the child uh, turning 18. And just know, we have an entire webinar on educational options for individuals with, this, with disabilities. Just know that there are a lot of wonderful options for higher education, including for children that have intellectual disabilities. So, okay, um, I think that's all we have for today. I always like to say, uh, meet our team. We work on an awesome team here at Consolidated Planning Group. We are nationally certified as uh, social security advisors and members of the Special Needs Planning Academy. So we are poised and ready to, to help you on your planning journey. And um, we can you know, work with other professionals that you already have on your team. We're not here uh, to break down what you already have. Um, most people already have a foundation that they have set up um, they, you know, they have some stuff that they already have in place, and we're here um, to build on that foundation that you have already um, already set up. So if you had deeper questions or more questions that we didn't get to today, we are out of time um, for today. Please um, email us directly, um, our contact information. We've, um, so if you're joining by podcast, our email address is contact at cpgcares.net. That's contact at cpgcares.net. You can email us and we'll get you a copy of today's slides uh, and a recording if you um, want a, a, an extra copy of that. And we can be reached at 281-690-1177. Um, on your phones, uh, your camera, you can hover over this. You're going to get a copy of the slides, but this will take you to a calendar link. We always offer free personalized consultations. So if you're interested in having a consultation with our firm, uh, it'll take you to a calendar and you can set up a time uh, to meet with us personally to discuss your situation. It's certainly been a pleasure uh, being with you again, Linda, today. Thank you, everyone. You guys um, asked wonderful questions today. And so it's certainly my pleasure being here and I look forward to joining you again soon. Okay. Take everyone. care. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. I'm going to go ahead and launch the poll that I, I mentioned earlier. Um, also, I have put the uh, website and the phone number for Partners Resource Network in the chat box, as well as uh, other information to directly contact me. I will put that in once more for anyone who might have missed it. And we so appreciate everyone for being here and thank you very much.